a very unlucky bounce in the ninth inning on a wild pitch leads to the D-backs blowing another winnable game. You are Locked On Diamondbacks, your daily Arizona Diamondbacks podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome into the Locked on Dimebacks podcast, part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. You're listening to who? The always charismatic host of this podcast, Miller Thomas, I'm a multimedia journalist, and I'm a graphic designer. So please go check out my website, millerthomas24.myportfolio.com to see all of my latest work. Today's episode is brought to you by Monopoly Go. I admit it, I have a competitive side and it is a Big fan of Monopoly Go, the mobile hit twist on a classic Monopoly game. So join your friends and download Monopoly Go, now free on the App Store or Google Play Store. On today's Locked on Dimebacks podcast, we'll talk about the D-backs blowing game one to the Chicago Cubs. We'll talk about game two. We'll preview it, discuss if Kyle Hendricks is the new Madison Bumgarner. Then we'll take a little trip down memory lane and do a little exercise called Where Are They Now? Zach Granke Trade Edition. So a lot to talk about on today's Locked on Dimebacks podcast. Thank you for making Locked on Dimebacks your first listen every day. I would not be able to do this podcast without you, my loyal listeners, sharing, subscribing, reviewing, doing all that so I could do this podcast for you. Thank you. It's free. It's available on all platforms. So please continue to tell your friends. And one of those platforms is YouTube. So please hit subscribe to Locked on Dimebacks on YouTube. Our goal is to hit 2,000 subs by the All-Star break. So please tell your friends and hit subscribe to Locked on Diamondbacks on YouTube. But now let's talk about that game one loss to the Chicago Cubs because I'm sure... You guys are as fired up as I am because how many games have we seen so far this season by this D-backs team where the D-backs are in position to win? They're up a few runs or maybe it's just one run late in the game, right? After the sixth, after the seventh, after the eighth inning, how many games, how many leads have the D-backs blown where it felt like the D-backs were in control? It felt like the D-backs had the momentum in the game and instead it's either poor bullpen pitching it's costly mistakes like we saw tonight either on the base paths or just by wow pitches taking unlucky bounces like the d-backs have had already five or six games this year that they should have won that they just flat out didn't last year the d-backs were coined the answer backs because they were stealing games late this year they are giving them away and they need to correct that issue if they want to contend at the end of the season because what they're doing right now is not good baseball and you can't continue to blow leads especially them doing it in a myriad of ways i could understand if it was just the bullpen every single time or it was just one area of weakness but it's different things every single time when you look at these blown games for the d-backs one game is the bullpen one game it's this one game it's that this d-backs team needs to play smarter The IQ that they're playing with at times is just very low. I won't blame the IQ for what happened in the ninth inning, but just some bad decision-making from the D-backs throughout this season, and they just need to get smarter as the year goes on. Talking about that ninth inning, it was basically the inning that changed the game for the D-backs and the Chicago Cubs because the Cubs, of course, were able to tie it up in the ninth inning, and it was just a super unfortunate play in which they were able to do that because Ginkle admittedly wasn't probably on his A game, but I still felt like he was going to, I felt like it was going to be one of those Ginkle outings where yes, he allows a couple base runners. Yes. He tiptoes around danger, but he was going to at least escape the damage was not able to escape tonight because with a man on second in Nico Horner, who is very fast. I might add Ginkle while pitching the dirt, Gabriel Moreno can't locate it. By the time he finds it, Horner never slows down. He rounds third base, and he slides into home plate. Yes, it's a close play, but just super unfortunate for the ball to bounce away. And Moreno, one of the best, if not the best, defensive catcher in Major League Baseball, unable to find it. 
Just a super unfortunate play. Not something you see happen a lot between Ginkle or Gabriel Moreno. So mistakes on both of them there. More on Kevin Ginkle probably for throwing the wild pitch than Gabriel Moreno for losing it. But either way, the D-backs end up letting the Chicago Cubs tie it up in the ninth inning. And then we get to extras. Bryce Jarvis looks pretty good in the 10th inning. He's able to dance around of a jam. He's not able to stop it in the uh, 11th inning, unfortunately. The Cubs get their lead runner on second base to score after they load the bases. But Bryce Jarvis, I thought, did his job in extra innings. I thought he had himself a good outing for the most part. Yes, he allowed the lead runner to score, but it's not like it goes against his earned run average. And he was able to down, dance out of the base to load a jam after that. D-backs had a chance to tie it up in the 11th inning with a man on third and Ketel Marte and just one out after Corbin Carroll gets him over. And the D-backs offense just does nothing in that moment. And they can't even get a man on third with one out home. The Atlanta Braves did it all series against the D-backs. The New York Yankees as well. We've seen other teams do the simple plays like that. And I feel like the D-backs this year have not done enough of the simple plays like just getting that sacrifice runner home. It should have been a tied ball game where the D-backs went into the 12th and maybe the 13th inning until they walked off the Chicago Cubs, especially against a pitching staff, which hasn't been that good this year. Uh, this D-backs offense had a really, really poor display in game one. They were unable to come through in the clutch multiple times. Two for 11 with runners in scoring position in the game. Obviously couldn't come through in the 11th inning. The D-backs offense only had three hits on the night total with eight strikeouts. Just not a good showing by this D-backs offense who, if you look at the stats the last couple of weeks, regressing in the wrong direction. So we need this offense to get better in game number two. We'll preview game number two in segment number two against Cal Hendricks because I want to pose the question, is Cal Hendricks the new massive bum garner? So we'll talk about that once we get to segment number two. Did like, though, Corbin Carroll did come through with runners in scoring position. They walked Ketel Marte intentionally. They are not scared of Corbin Carroll right now, and they shouldn't be because you look at the numbers for Corbin Carroll. They're not that impressive right now. He's had a very slow start to the season, so I'm not surprised to see that they weren't afraid to intentionally walk Ketel Marte uh, you know, later in the game. Like Corbin Carroll was able to make the Cubs pay and able to come through with runners in scoring position. Back-to-back games where he now has a hit with the runners in scoring position. Good job by Corbin Carroll there. We're going to need more of that going forward. Did like the fact that the bullpen was really good in this game as well. Miguel Castro, he needs to be off the team. He gave up a hit as soon as he came into the ball game, which was... Of course, expected. I think I'm going to live bet every batter to get a Miguel Castro hit going forward because it just feels more than likely that if you bet on the opposing batter to get a hit against Castro, you're probably going to win some money. So I think I'm going to do that going forward. Man supply looked great. Ryan Thompson looked great. Kevin Ginkle gave up an earned run, but really because of the wild pitch, I think Ginkle would have been fine if... You know, Moreno was at least able to find that wild pitch right off the dirt. So shaky performance, I guess, by him. And then Bryce Jarvis, I think, did pitch well in this game. And if you look at Bryce Jarvis recently, over his last 6.1 innings pitch, no earned runs for Bryce Jarvis. So he's looked really good recently for the D-backs. So D-backs got a good Corbin Carroll coming through in the clutch. They got a good bullpen performance, but it was really their offense and Kevin Ginkle in the ninth. That just let the D-backs down tonight. I mean, they had, I think, nine hard-hit balls against Ben Brown, which is categorized as balls in play over 95-mile-an-hour exit velocity. Like, they were getting major hard contact against Ben Brown, who has been awful to start the year. They just weren't finding the gaps in the offense. And sometimes that's just the story of the night. So hopefully the D-backs, who were able to make good quality contact and get a lot of loud outs, Hopefully, they're able to pick it up in game number two, and hopefully the offense is able to come alive against the massive Bumgarner of the Chicago Cubs.
Now I want to talk to you guys about my competitive side because I love playing this little game called Monopoly Go. I'm sure you've heard of it. It's been downloaded over 150 million times. It's a great twist on Monopoly where you play on not one, but hundreds of Monopoly boards in crazy locations, building up amazing cities that bring you big money. But the best part is messing with my friends. I can't charge them rent on my iconic properties, just like classic Monopoly. But now I can also rob their vaults of riches for myself. And the leaderboards show me who the biggest Monopoly tycoon is. And of course, it's me. But it's not just my competitive side that loves it. You can also team up with friends and people all around the world in time tournaments to earn huge rewards. So get in the game and join your friends. Download Monopoly Go now free on the App Store or Google Play Store. All right, all right, all right. Let's get back into the Locked on Diamondbacks podcast. And don't forget, if you like the show, please follow me on Twitter at CreatorThomas24 for the personal account or look up Locked on Diamondbacks on both Twitter and Instagram for the podcast handle. But now let's talk about if Kyle Hendricks is the new Madison Bumgarner because the D-backs are playing against Kyle Hendricks in game number two of the series. I actually saw this question posed on Bleacher Report because they had a little article talking about the 10 biggest surprises. I think that was the article of 2024. And one of them was Kyle Hendricks turning into Madison Bumgarner. And I did like that premise because when you looked at Kyle Hendricks stats from this season compared to Madison Bumgarner in his last season, yeah, Cal Hendricks is as bad, if not worse, than Mad Bum was in that final year for the Arizona Dimebacks. The only difference is when saying, is Cal Hendricks the new Mad Bum? You can only say that if you're talking about Mad Bum's last season because Cal Hendricks last season was at least very effective for the Chicago Cubs. 3-7 year array, 137 innings pitch. Like last season, he was at least effective. This is his first year where he's been absolutely horrendous. Madison Bumgarner from day one with the D-backs was a disaster. So that's the only difference between these two. Hendricks, it's more of a decline the last few years with this year being absolutely horrendous. Mad Bum was horrendous for like a four-year period. But if we're just talking about Mad Bum's final season versus Kyle Hendricks this year, yes, there are a lot of similarities and parallels between those two pitchers because both of them are absolutely horrendous when you look at the stats mad bum age 33 his final season with the d-backs cal hendricks currently age 34 with the chicago cubs mad bum that final year through four starts with the d-backs 16.2 innings pitched 25 hits four home runs 19 earned runs 15 walks and 10 strikeouts a lot of walks, a lot of hits, a lot of earned runs for Mad Bum through four starts in his final season with the D-backs. But comparing it to Kyle Hendricks, through three starts in 2024, 12.2 innings pitch, 17 earned runs, 26 hits allowed, five home runs. Did I say 17 home runs? 17 earned runs, 26 hits, five home runs, four walks, eight strikeouts. He is giving up. He has given up more hits, more home runs, and just two earned runs less despite pitching four innings less than Madison Bumgarner. He's given up basically at a higher rate of hits and home runs than a Mad Bum. That's what Kyle Hendricks is doing right now in 2024. If you could believe that, there is actually someone putting up worse numbers than what Matt Bone was doing for the D-backs just last season. Hendricks right now, it doesn't matter if you're a righty or a lefty. Fire them all up. This should be a situation where it does not matter your lineup. You should just throw your best players out there against Kyle Hendricks because against both the righties and lefties, Kyle Hendricks is getting absolutely crushed in 2024 over a 380 average allowed and over 1100 OPS allowed to both righties and lefties. So I better not see a Jace Peterson or a Kevin Newman, like 
Give me Blaze at shortstop. Give me Eugenio at third. Give me the best players for the best lineup against Kyle Hendricks because this should be one where the D-backs offense can potentially eat against Kyle Hendricks. And the D-backs offense should not be afraid to be aggressive early in this matchup because when you look at the splits for Kyle Hendricks, on the first pitch thrown, over a 500 average and over a 1,700 OPS allowed. Kyle Hendricks has been horrendous this year. And don't worry, guys, if you compare all the numbers I just listed out to Mad Bum, very similar to what Mad Bum was doing in 2023. So feel justified in the notion that the D-backs made the right move by DFAing him last year. We just wish the move came four seasons earlier. And as you dive deeper into the numbers, you notice with Kyle Hendricks, as he goes deeper into the ball game, the numbers are going to get worse. They're pretty bad. Those first like three or four innings, they get worse the second and especially that third time through the lineup. I'm not even going to say the numbers because they are absolutely horrendous. And I think a lot of the issues with Kyle Hendricks this season could just be to the could just be due to the fact that he's become super predictable. 46 of his 47 fastballs thrown this year have gone to left-handed batters. 78 of his 92 sinkers have gone to right-handed batters. So if you're a lefty, just sit on the fastball. If you're a righty, just sit on the sinker. And basically 80 to 99% chance he's going to throw that pitch to you. And when he does, it's not like it's that special of a pitch. It's not like it's going to fool you or do anything like that. He doesn't throw that hard. He tops out around 87, 88 miles per hour when he's throwing his fastball. His spin rate is absolutely awful. It's around like 2,000 RPMs. Like There's nothing really special about Kyle Hendricks right now, which is a little sad because he used to be one of the best pitchers in baseball. If you look at his numbers from 2014 till 2020, so basically his age 30 birthday, like he was 180 plus innings a year, a, a two nine to a three two ERA, a top, you know, three Cy Young finalists, potentially like Kyle Hendricks was an absolute stud to start his career. The last few seasons since 2021, 477 ERA, 4.8 ERA last season, 3.7. And then this year, 12.08 ERA. Kyle Hendricks is obviously in the decline, and that's okay. That's what happens to pitchers when you get older, but the D back should be able to take advantage of Kyle Hendricks in this advanced stage of his career. And if you want to, if you want a fun fact, here's a fun fact for your friends. Do you want to guess which player in this D back lineup is the best against Kyle Hendricks in his career? I'll give you a hint. It's a player that I just mentioned that I don't want to see in the lineup. It's Jace Peterson. Jace Peterson is 10 for 25 with five rubies and two home runs against Kyle Hendricks in his career. I don't know why, but he's crushed Kyle Hendricks. So wouldn't be surprised if Tori Lovello looks at that and says, you know what? We're throwing Jace Peterson out there in game number two. So for the offense, fire up everyone who is playing well because against Kyle Hendricks, it could be an offensive explosion with how he's pitched this season, and he is doing his best Madison Bumgarner impression. Then for the D-backs, Tommy Henry on the mound. Just keep what you just keep doing what you're doing, kid. Five innings pitch, two earned runs in back-to-back games with five to six Ks between them. We'll take that. The Cubs are a pretty good offense right there with the D-backs in terms of numbers. If Tommy Henry can spin the same kind of game, we might need one more inning because we had to go to the bullpen today with Merrill Kelly, only five innings pitch and the extra innings. We might need a little bit more from Tommy Henry in game number two. So if he can do what he's done the last couple of weeks and maybe pitch into the sixth inning, the D-backs will for sure be grateful for that performance from Tommy Henry. Now we'll talk about the Zach Greinke trade and do a little game of where are they now? But before we get into that conversation, if you want to buy any tickets to a D-backs game this season, then the best place you're going to want to go to purchase those tickets is going to be game time. Game time is the best place to buy tickets. 
Take the stress out of buying tickets with Game Time. See the view from your seat on your phone before you buy. All in pricing shows your total cost up front. Buy tickets in seconds with two taps. Last minute deals on tickets right up to the start of the event. Exclusive flash deals and sponsor deals on tickets for football, basketball, baseball, concerts, comedy, theater, and more. Zone deals where you pick the section and game time picks the seats for big time savings. So take the guesswork out of buying tickets with game time. Download the game time app, create an account, and use code locked on MLB for $20 off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account or redeem code locked on MLB for $20 off. Download the game time app today. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. Also want to talk to you guys about LinkedIn Sales Navigator because are you struggling to close deals? Selling is tougher than ever, and that's why I want to tell you about LinkedIn Sales Navigator. LinkedIn Sales Navigator is a sales intelligence platform that helps professionals effectively prospect and engage high-value customers, drive higher revenue, and increase sales performance. Sales Navigator helps you target the right buyers, service key signals such as job changes or which accounts you should prioritize, and shows you hidden allies who can find those buyers that are most likely to convert. Fueled by LinkedIn's 1 billion member platform, Sales Navigator gives you the most up-to-date first-party data, enabling you to unlock conversations with people that matter. Right now, you can try LinkedIn Sales Navigator and get a 60-day free trial at linkedin.com slash locked on. That is Sales Navigator to help you sell like a superstar today. Just go to linkedin.com slash locked on and get started. All right, all right, all right. Let's get back into the Locked On Dimebacks podcast. And let's play a game of Where Are They Now? Zach Grinky Trade Edition. I was inspired to do this topic because the D-backs DFA'd Corbin Martin this past week. He was picked up by the Milwaukee Brewers. That officially ends the tenure of all players from Zach Grinky deal. So I want to do a little look back and talk about where the players are now because it's insane to think about the D-backs a few seasons ago acquired three players in the top five of someone's organization plus another guy who's a top 30 prospect in the deal and none and none of them are with the organization just a few short seasons later as they're starting to peak right which is the even crazier part none of them are even here for the D-backs actually winning games none of them are even contributing so the Zach Greinke deal ended up being a major bust for the Arizona Dimebacks so let's talk about who they got and where they are now the D-backs acquired number three prospect Seth Beer number four prospect JV Braskakis number five Corbin Marin and number 22 Josh Rojas those rankings are courtesy of MLB Pipeline and just for prosperity's sake, here are some other prospects who were ranked in 2019 in the Astros organization. Number two prospect for the Astros at the time, Kyle Tucker. Number three, Jordan Alvarez. Number eight, Brian Abreu. Number 11, Framber Valdez. Number 16, Miles Straw. Number 27, Jeremy Pena. There were superstars, solid relievers, great starters, Quality outfielders and very good shortstops available in that top 30. And the D-backs chose none of them. Somehow they got four prospects from the Astros top 30 organization and none of them panned out. One of them did turn out to be a solid major leaguer for the D-backs, but he's not here anymore. And we'll talk about him later. The first guy I want to talk about is Seth Beer, the highest ranking prospect from this trade and someone that was projected to be a big time bat with a limited defensive ceiling, but in the end, his bat never came around and we saw all the defensive weaknesses. He ended up only being a player that can hit minor league pitching, which is something you never want to acquire. 860 OPS over six seasons in the minors, but when we look at the majors, 586 OPS in just 120 at-bats, his defense was horrid it was terrible and so he needed his offense to make up for it he was the guy that really didn't have a position in the minor leagues and his offense made up for it in the minors but once he got to the majors it was 
just not working out for Seth Beer offensively after what the first couple weeks of the season. He just went into a season long slump. And it really shouldn't be that surprising because despite the numbers that he put up in the minor leagues, if you actually go back and read the scouting reports on Seth Beer when he was uh, in the Astros organization, if you just go on MLB.com and look at those old scouting reports, they talk about how his offense was a concern. Despite him putting up elite numbers, he was someone that never hit well with the wood bat back in high school and all the showcases. So people did have a concern with his bat actually translating on the major league level. And that's what we saw with Seth Beer. Once he got called up by the D-backs, he had a hot start to the season, and then he just flailed out by the end of it. And so Seth Beer now, currently no longer with the D-backs, of course, will always, always remember him for the opening day walk-off against the San Diego Padres. Monster home run on beer night. No one could have expected it, but he's now with the Pittsburgh Pirates out of being <laughs> he's with the Pittsburgh Pirates after being drafted out of the rule five minor league draft. He's playing for the double A team. I don't think we're going to see Seth beer on the major league level ever again, and probably not for any of these guys outside of Josh Rojas. JV Briscakis was considered to have the best fastball slider combination when he was taken 15th overall out of the draft, but he was a guy that never was able to put it together. We thought maybe he could be the closer of the future. That's kind of what he was coined as when he was acquired by the D-backs, a really high leverage back-end reliever that could potentially be the closer for you. Missed a ton of bats in the minor leagues. But if you also look at his numbers in double A with the Houston Astros, despite missing bats via the strikeout, there was also a lot of loud, hard contact given up by J.B. Braskakis, inflated ERA. And it was always the same when he came over to the D-backs and was called up on the major league level. Like things never changed for J.B. Braskakis. He would flash the potential. You saw it with the fastball and the slider combo. He could throw it super hard. He had a wicked movement on the slider, but the command just wasn't good enough for JB. He also had a big injury that knocked him out most of 2022 that hurt his development. In the end, he finished his D-backs career with a 7.71 ERA, 17.1 innings pitch, 15 earned runs, and 14 strikeouts. He was picked up by the Mariners after being DFA'd, and now he's on the Milwaukee Brewers. And joining him on the Brewers is the other piece to the Grinky trade, Corbin Martin, who was projected to be a mid-rotation starter, but because of bad command and poor health, he never panned out for the D-backs. And again, Corbin Martin, another guy. Like all these guys, if you look at their scouting reports, there's like obvious weaknesses that the D-backs like just didn't care about. Corbin Martin, he was a guy that had inconsistent command going back to college, and it just stayed that way when once he got to the major leagues. Like his command never got better. He missed all of 2023 with injury. Like there were just so many different variables as to why Corbin Martin didn't pan out with the D backs. When you look at his numbers, 728 year Ray, 38 innings pitch, 31 earned runs, eight home runs, and 26 strikeouts excuse me, 26 walks allowed. Corbin Martin, which is never good for the D-backs, which is just really disappointing. And now he's on the Brewers with J.B. Braskakis. We'll see if they could resurrect those careers. The only player that worked out from this trade was Josh Rojas. He was the worst player in the deal in terms of the rankings, but he's the only one that is a major leaguer right now and I think is going to stick in the major leagues. He crushed minor league hitting en route to being the D-back shortstop, and he did a damn solid job at being the D-back shortstop. In 2022, in 125 games, he had a 3.1 war and 23 stolen bases. You will definitely take those numbers. Now, he was eventually packaged in a deal to get the D-backs a closer, something that they desperately needed, and he was also packaged because he was struggling last season and Domo was having a breakout year. So we were sad to see Josh Rojas leave, but it was a smart trade by the D-backs. 
Now he's continued to get an opportunity with the Mariners. He's even pitched in two games this season. So want to do this exercise because it shows you how hard it is to pick prospects and how Mike Hazen has completely flipped that strategy of going from these raw projects to just give me the guy who is talented, who has a high floor, because that is what Gabriel Moreno is. He had this super high ceiling, but we were also like, you know what? Defensive capability base running and hitting Gabriel Moreno at the very least is going to be a very good catcher. Couldn't say that with those other players acquired in the Zach Greinke deal. They did not have the floor of a Gabriel Moreno. So I think Mike Hazen has changed his trading philosophy just a little bit. And I think it's for the best for the D backs moving forward. Now that's it for this edition of the locked on Dimebacks podcast. Come back tomorrow for more Dimebacks news coverage and insight. Hopefully the D backs get that victory in game two. And as always stay safe. Stay healthy. Doses.